I think is, this year, probably in 2025, we at Meta are going to have an AI that can effectively be a sort of mid-level engineer that you have at your company that can write code. Mm. It was shocking. Um, so Mark Zuckerberg goes on the Joe Rogan podcast, and he's yet another CEO of these major tech companies saying that AI will have an effect on coders, on software engineers. Now, a lot of them are saying slightly different things, like it will act like a mid-level engineer, or it might somehow augment software engineers, help them, etc. A lot of people are, of course, concerned that maybe that's going to eliminate a lot of jobs. This isn't too dissimilar from, for example, what Francois Chalet, the founder of the ARC AGI prize and the competition, the benchmark, he's saying something very, very similar. So this is Francois Chalet. This is on the Machine Learning Street Talk. I'll link it down below. He's asking, what do we see change once we hit AGI? So here's his answer specifically how it relates to sort of programming and coding and software engineering. So he's not specifying year. He's not saying 2025, but he's saying here's kind of what effect that might have driving a blind man and the elephant type challenge where loads and loads of developers have their own perspective on a very small part of the system. But when we have the AGI version, how could that change? Broadly speaking, I think programming from input to output pairs will be a widespread uh, uh, programming paradigm in the future, and that will be accessible to anyone because you don't need to write any code, right? You're just specifying what you want the program to do, and then the computer just programs itself. And if there's any ambiguity, by the way, in what you meant, and there will always be ambiguity, right? Uh, especially if, uh, if the instructions are provided by a non-technical user. Uh, well, you don't have to worry about it because the computer will uh, ask you to clarify. If you tell you, okay, so uh, I created basically the most plausible program given what you told me, uh, but it, 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 there's some ambiguity here and there. So what about uh, this input? Currently I have this output. Is that, does that look right? Do you want to change it? And as you change it, you know, iteratively, you are um, creating this correct program in collaboration with the computer. So we're seeing this idea echoed by more and more people in the industry. You know, we've had Satya Nadella of Microsoft. We have Jensen Huang of NVIDIA, Mark Zuckerberg of Meta slash Facebook, Francois Chalet of the Arc AGI Benchmark. More and more people seem to be saying that AI will greatly impact the software engineering jobs. Now, everybody has a sort of slightly different take on when that's coming to a degree and will it, will it sort of replace people or just sort of augment their abilities, make them, making them more effective. However, at the same time, we're seeing kind of more and more signs that maybe some of the companies are kind of already expecting not to need as many software engineers. So for example, Salesforce won't hire engineers thanks to AI gains. So Salesforce will not hire additional engineers this year due to AI-driven productivity improvements. The company plans to add 1,000 to 2,000 salespeople to explain the value of AI to clients. AI technology is improving workforce capabilities. And despite changes, Salesforce does anticipate overall growth in employee numbers in the coming years. The transition may be challenging, but necessary. So salespeople are safe for now. But the fact that a, I mean, Salesforce is a tech company, largely tech driven, that Salesforce is not hiring any more engineers, it's not hiring additional engineers this year. I mean, certainly seems like a big deal. Now, this doesn't mean it's not that they're laying people off. They're just saying that as sort of like the turnover rate, you know, other people leave, go on to work at other companies. The people that they do retain are so much more productive that they simply don't need to kind of refill the company with more engineers. So certainly if you have a long tenure, you've been working in this for a while, you might be just fine. You might not notice it. You might even become that much more productive, but to the people that are just entering the industry or thinking about it, going through college in order to become a software engineer, certainly something like this might seem kind of scary, kind of ominous. As Francois Chalet said, for example, in the future, you're just going to say what you want. Even a non-technical user might just kind of say what they want. Like, hey, I want an app that does this. And if it's like an ambiguous statement, then the AI is going to be like, all right, what, what do you mean by that exactly? So it's going to like walk you through. It's going to get those ideas out of your head and it's going to turn into code, a working code. So let's briefly take a look at the segment where Mark Zuckerberg is talking about AI on the recent Joe Rogan podcast. Most of the podcast was maybe like a little bit more like political and other stuff, but there's this sort of piece of maybe like 20, 30 minutes where they do talk AI. And it's pretty interesting. It's kind of towards the end. It's buried in there. So a lot of people might not have gotten to it. An AI that can effectively be a sort of mid-level engineer that you have at your company 
that can write code. Mm. And once you have that, then in the beginning it'll be really expensive to run, and then you can get it to be more efficient, and then over time we'll get to the point where a lot of the code in our apps and and including the AI that we generate is actually going to be built by AI engineers instead of people engineers. But but I don't know. I, I think that that'll augment the people working on it. So I mean, my my view on this is like the future people are just going to be so much more creative and are going to be freed up to do kind of crazy things. It goes back to, you know, my daughter was like playing with Legos before and mm -hmm. they kind of ran out of Legos. And then now she can have Minecraft and can build whatever she wants and it's so much better. It's just like, I think it's the future versions of this stuff are just going to be wild. But Unquestionably. Yeah. Uh, another concern that people have is that it's going to eliminate a lot of jobs. Yeah. You know, what do you think about that? Well, I, I think it's too... It's too early to know exactly how it plays out, but my guess is that it'll probably create more creative jobs than it... Well, I, I guess if you look at the history of all this stuff, mm -hmm. my, my understanding is like 100 years ago, um, in, in, I don't know if this was 100 or 150 years ago, but it was like at some point not too far along uh, in, in the grand scheme of things, like the vast majority of people in society were farmers. Right, because they kind of needed to be in order to create enough food for, for everyone to survive. And then we turned that into a in like an industrial process. And now it's like 2% of society are farmers and we get all the food that we need. So what did that free up everyone else to do? Well, some of them went on to do other things that are sort of like creative pursuits or cultural pursuits or other jobs. And then some percent of it just went towards recreation, right? So I think generally people just don't work as many hours um, today as they did when back when everyone needed to farm in order to have enough food for everyone to survive. So I think that trend is sort of played out as technology has grown. And so my guess is that like the percent of people who will be doing stuff that's like physically required for humanity to survive will get to be smaller and smaller as it has more people will dedicate themselves to kind of creative and artistic and cultural pursuits. Um, I think that's generally good. I think the number of hours in a week that someone will have to work in order to be able to get by will probably continue to shrink. Um, yet, I think people who are super engaged in what they do are going to be able to work really hard and accomplish way more than they ever could before because they have um, like this unimaginable leverage from, from having a lot more technology. So I think that that, if you just like fast forwarded or extrapolated out the the historical technological trend is what you'd get. I think the question is what you raised, which is, is this qualitatively a different type of thing that somehow um, obsoletes people? But I, I just think when you're asking that, it's just important to remind ourselves that like at every step along the way of human progress and technology, people thought that the technology that we were developing was going to obsolete people. So maybe this time it's really different, but I would guess that what will happen is that the technology will get integrated into like everything that we do, which again is why I think it's really important that it's open source and that it's widely available. So that way it's not just like one company or one government kind of monopolizing the whole thing. One thing that I found absolutely hilarious is this point where Joe Rogan brings up that whole thing with O1 trying to escape, trying to like destroy competing models, trying to change its own guardrails and just completely like misbehaving and just completely just kind of appearing to be a rogue AI. Now I've covered that in the O1 tries to escape video that was extremely popular. One of my biggest videos to date, I think, I found it funny because for a long time, you know, Joe Rogan would have his uh, sort of, he was a fan of conspiracy theories and aliens and, and, and all sorts of stuff. So he would be talking about rogue AI for years and years and years now. And, and he would talk about aliens for years and years and years and whatever. And it's so funny how like now a lot of the stuff that they would talk about as conspiracy theories, I wouldn't say it's coming true, but it's just like, it's in the news, you know? So, and this is, of course, he pulls up a news article talking about that experiment with O1 trying to escape. It's phenomenal. Take a listen. You know that chat gpt tried to copy itself when it found out it was being shut down tried to rewrite its code um it was shocking um when it was under the impression that it was going to become obsolete they were going to have a hmm. new version of it and it would be shut down it tried copying its code and it tried rewriting its code like unprompted yeah i mean it depends on what goal you give it 
I mean, there right. are there are all these weird examples of this. What is this? So pull up the the, the, the headline. Voice. AI fights back. The story of ChatGPT attempting to copy itself. So this was six days ago. So uh, during controlled safety testing, ChatGPT-01 was tasked with achieving its objectives at all costs. Under these conditions, the model allegedly took concerning steps, attempted to disable oversight mechanisms meant to regulate its behavior, tried to replicate its own code to avoid being replaced by newer versions, exhibited deceptive behaviors when monitoring systems intervened. It's very interesting how as AI is growing, it's sort of uh, contacting and crossing over with pretty much every aspect of our lives. It's not just like technology or science fiction anymore. It's, you know, Joe Rogan's talking about it. There's a lot more sort of a philosophical discussions about it. It's affecting the economy. It's nuts. It's going to keep growing and touching every aspect of our lives. And this paper about the sort of the shenanigans, the in-context scheming of the O1, this was a very interesting paper to read. And I got to give Joe Rogan a lot of credit for this. I really sort of applaud how he responded to it because, for example, when I published what I learned about or when I published my video, the stuff on Twitter, the response was extremely polarizing. You have the people that are saying this is the end of the world. It's going to kill the entire humanity. We have to like immediately shut it down. And on the other side, you would have people that would say, hey, don't spread misinformation. This is nothing. Nothing happened. It just did what it was told. And the founder of Apollo Research went online and kind of said kind of the same thing that I've been saying about it is that this is not one extreme or the other. This isn't nothing. But it's also like not the end of the world, some scary scenario. What it is, is that we have a rapid improvement in AI capabilities. The O1 model is far ahead of anything else. It also happens to be the one that's like most effective at these like in context of deception and stuff like that it engages in every single one of them, sometimes unprompted. And basically what that means is as these models get smarter and better, they don't just automatically become sort of more well behaved. In fact, as they get smarter, their capability for, you know, these uh, sort of deceptive tactics gets better. And that means that AI alignment is still an open problem. And a lot of people, for example, take shots at Sam Altman, who's saying, hey, we need to be releasing this technology into the world sort of incrementally in steps and letting it interact with people, right? Having people interact with it, trying to break it, trying to poke holes in it, et cetera. I think this is what he means by that. He puts O1 into the hands of everyone around the world. These Apollo research, you know, they're red teamers, they're official red teamers, but, you know, anyone can do this sort of work. Not, nothing's stopping you. They don't have any extra privileges. You can open up your own AI or sort of research, AI safety research lab, you know, Pliny, the liberator online, sort of like jailbreaks these things. And as they do, as we all sort of publish this stuff online, as we talk about it, the AI developers get to see the problems. So as OpenAI and everybody else, right, they put GPT-4 out and all the people around the world figure out all the things that are wrong with GPT. How can you jailbreak it? The, the things that it's going to do wrong, the mistakes it makes. And they're able to take that and build sort of the next version. And then everybody breaks that. And little by little, not only are we getting more and more sort of used to dealing with this technology, but also the sort of iterative release process also helps both like the people that are trying to use it and the developers that are trying to make it more safe kind of work together to do those things. So similar to troubleshooting bugs and stuff like that, you know, you put it out in the world, the community finds issues, the developers improve those issues, not just opening eye, but everybody else that, that's seeing this is able to see, okay, hey, this is a problem. Let's see how we can maybe come up with a solution to that. But I figured I just kind of uh, mentioned that here. It was really interesting to see kind of like that stuff appear on the Joe Rogan podcast. But let me know what you think about the whole AI encoding thing. Is it just going to eliminate the sort of the coding jobs? As, as somebody put it, it might eliminate coders, but you're still going to have the need for, you know, engineers. So like the people that think through problems and kind of like find the creative solutions and test them, et cetera. I don't think that's going away anytime soon, but less and less we, we don't need like coding as in a sense of like, if I give you a sentence in English, you know what sort of a script to write to to have that happen. More and more AI does take care of that. Even before, we would go online to sometimes just copy and paste somebody else's code that somebody else written, right, using stuff on GitHub, etc. So over the last two decades, let's say, the need to like letter by letter, you know, pecking out the code on the keyboard, that's going away. Now it's becoming like more, you know, you're using templates, you're using sort of that sort of autocorrect, autofill stuff more and more. You're hitting tap to complete the line, etc. 
we still need kind of that brain power, that engineering brain power to sort of understand the problem, break it down into steps, figure out how to turn that into sort of into code, troubleshoot everything, you know, user test everything, et cetera. Will these AI systems be able to handle most of the work of a mid-level AI engineer, as uh, Mark Zuckerberg put it? Maybe. Maybe it will happen in 2025, like he thinks it might. Will it be able to replace a God-tier software engineer? I don't think so. Not in 2025. And maybe not for years to come. But let me know what you think about this. If you were just entering college now, would you go into computer science? Would you go into learning about how to be a software engineer? Or would you feel like this might be a field that's going away? If you made this far, thank you so much for watching. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.